Talking About Horses, bringing you closer to some of the best horsemen in the world for tips, insights, and stories. Listen at home, at work, in the car, or in the saddle. This is Talking About Horses. Here's your host, Patrick King. Hey there, gang. Patrick King here, and I want to thank you for tuning in for episode number 27 of Talking About Horses. Today, I'm pleased to be joined by one of America's most respected horse trainers, Charles Wilhelm. His extensive experience spans 40 years of training in dressage, working cow horse, reining western pleasure, and trail. He's known for his superb skills in communicating and motivating people, as well as his natural abilities with the horse. Charles is one of the few trainers specializing in reschooling horses with problems. He also offers performance training, including Western Pleasure, Cowboy Dressage, and Ranch Versatility. Charles, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. Oh, awesome, awesome. It's, it's great to have you on the show. We were chatting a little bit uh, before we went live here that uh, you and I have never gotten the opportunity yet to meet. Um, it's, and I know you exactly. said you've been kind of on the circuit, and I know I've been on the circuit for a number of years now. So it's great to be able to connect in this way, even though we've not yet met. Well, you know, it's better than nothing, you know. It's uh, making that connection and meeting people in our same industry as you are is it's always a good thing, you know. I, I love sharing ideas with other people, and uh, and you know what? We don't have to always agree by uh, every, what everyone does or doesn't do, you know what I mean? So, yeah, absolutely. But it's good to connect. Yes, absolutely. No, and I appreciate it very much. So for uh, anybody in our audience out here that doesn't really know you or maybe hasn't heard of you, can you give us a little bit your history with horses? Well, I, I think I'm kind of like a, um, a few other trainers around. You know, we all started out with a passion with horses. Uh, my first introduction was with a... Um, uh, you know, actually, he was more of a cowman more than uh, uh, you know, do with horses. Uh, and he had horses, don't get me wrong. And he started his own horses. In fact, he was starting his own horses at 74. His son was big into the horse industry, but I, I think where I learned my work ethic was with his father, uh, Clarence Chown. Uh, senior and uh, so you know we're always fixing fences and you're up early in the morning and you work all day and uh, then then I was introduced to his son he came down from Northern California and uh, and that's where I got involved in uh, horses with him uh, you know I was with a single mother and uh, he actually would act as a guardian for me uh, I didn't have a father at the time, and uh, and that's where I actually was uh, introduced to the Lord and accepted the Lord uh, as a you know teenager, and so that's kind of where it all started, you know. And thank God the Lord had His hand on me and guided me to the right people because. You know, with those two people, which is a big part of my life, and Roy Rogers and Gene Autrys, which my, you know, part of my heroes. Yeah. That's why I'm here today. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. That's awesome. So that's the, that was Clarence Chone, you said? Chown. Chown. C H O W N. Okay. Chown. Okay. And uh, that was senior, and then he had a son, Clarence Chown Jr. Okay. Yeah, okay. and he's got some sons uh, doing quite well in the equitation uh, or roping world and, you know, part of the horse industry as well. And Tommy Chown, he's Western Pleasure. Okay. Anybody out there is familiar with the Pleasure world, he's been quite successful. Gotcha. And, uh, yep. So they've all been doing good, and uh, here again, you know, there was, those are all good memories. And, of course, then you go into adulthood and... And you get a family, and and then pretty soon through life, you get to be 72 and kick back and relax a little bit and still enjoy horses. There you go. Good, good. So you started uh, you started with Mr. Chown as as a teenager. Um, what yes? What got you starting into horses as a profession? How did that How did that come about? 
Well, we always had horses, and I was involved in horses, went to a lot of shows, uh, uh, and was in the show world for a while. And then, um, you know, I got, I had to go get a real job because you was always told you can't make a living in the horse industry. Right. You know, of course, this goes back 60 some years, you know. Um, and I got married and had a, uh, a daughter and had to go out and make some money. So I had to go out and get a real job, but I always stayed in touch with the horses. Uh, always had horses throughout my years. Until about oh, 30 years ago, um, I decided to go professionally, uh, had horse property, and uh, and that's kind of where it was. But what motivated me was I had open heart surgery, and I decided that uh, uh, I'd be awfully upset if I died and get and didn't do what I really like to do, and that's with working with horses full time. That's awesome. That's awesome. What were your What was your job, or were your jobs before horses? Well, you know, I, I was quite successful in the real estate. I, I had an automotive business uh, that was quite uh, successful. My wife was interior designer. Oh, okay. Uh, was in probably a lot of probably fifteen, sixteen uh, magazines like. Uh, uh, <clears throat> like uh, so I'm trying to think here, garden, garden magazines, uh, okay. interior designs. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, so, as I got busier, she left her job and and supported me. Of course, then we you know hit the road and hmm. and uh, back one of the very few. Uh, there was only a few pet people at the time that were on the road, that was Pat Pirelli, John Lyons, Richard Shrake, and Lynn Palm. And I have to say, with Lynn Palm, uh, it kind of is what kind of got me in touch with, uh, because her background is that she likes to use uh, the philosophy of dressage. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and so I got a little taste of that. And I got to know her quite well. We never did anything together, but uh, we got to know each other. And so when uh, uh, dressage training from Australia, uh, uh, gee, my brain, brain just went uh, south, uh, Major Miguel Tavora, uh, which was uh, underling of Una Oliveira, mm -hmm. Uh, I was told I should ride with him because we had a lot in common. And I said, well, I don't think so. Because in the Bay Area, uh, which is probably mostly hunter jumpers, you know, stadium jumping, dressage, eventing, kind of like here in Aiken. <laughs> and um, so anyway, I decided, oh, okay, I'll go ahead and, uh, and I'll ride with him. And I did, and he came to my place, and what I was impressed with, not only with him, but his uh, apprentice, I guess you would say, he was from New York. And Major McGill, you know, he, he was from the Portuguese Army, and that's how I got the Major, but, you know, he'd get on these paint horses of mine and make them look like different kind of frame altogether. And at that point in time, I was pretty good colt start. I mean, I, 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 I was getting on colts probably before I could even hardly lead the darn things. I kind of <laughs> push him in, drag him in, run him into the round pen, you know, in about an hour, hour and a half, I'm on him, you know? Right. And, uh, and the interesting thing about that, you know, uh, I was on him, but, you know, uh, Sometimes you felt like you was on a keg of dynamite, you know. So, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I, I got to, I was impressed with him, you know, and uh, and I had a chance to work with John Lyons a little bit, and his was always on the, uh, uh, you know, pressure release, mm -hmm. and you know, the horse just gives you something, you know, you you release on that, and uh, so. He, Major McGarrow was kind of in that direction, but totally different um, equitation. 
And I've always thought I was a pretty good rider. You know, I'm used to riding fence lines, dragging calves, and, you know, whatever, and getting on a bunch of colts. But uh, I realized then I didn't know nothing about riding. Ah, yeah, yeah. You know, equitation. Mm-hmm. So he came over, you know, and he still comes over. I saw him just before I left, and I hadn't ridden him with him for years. But he, uh, you know, he'd be over three or four times a year, and uh, and doing clinics, and uh, and I'd ride with him. You know, he'd be here, you know, three weeks to you know to six weeks, and I'd ride with him almost every day. And uh, and I learned a lot. You know, and uh, uh, we got to talking, and I don't know if any audience or yourself, uh, uh, he, he says, you, you remind me of Bouchard. Okay. And, uh, and, uh, and Bouchard was really on to the, the release, you know, mm-hmm. mask and the horse gives your release. Mm-hmm. So I didn't know who in the heck that was, but <laughs> 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 later on, you know, I found a book on him. Right. Uh, and I wrote it, I mean, read it, and, it, and it's not one of those books back in those days you, you pick up and you, you go through it. I mean, I'd have to literally read a page two or three times <laughs> right. and, and go off and have to think about it, you know, because it just warped my mind. You know? Yes, yes, they were written like college manuals. Yeah, exactly, you know, but anyway, and I share that book with people, but anyway, um, that, that person really brought me around to, you know, what equitation was all about, what riding is all about. And then, you know, then I ended up buying a place on the East Bay. I was in the West Bay, and uh, we bought a, a, a facility. Uh, it was a hunter jumper barn, and uh, they wanted a smaller place because he wanted to start training for uh, the Olympics, and uh, if you have a big place, you you know you probably understand, you know, and that's all you do, you know. So right. you're a slave to the ranch, which to me I didn't feel like I was a slave because I enjoyed it. it, it became, horses is a lifestyle, as you know. Yes. And uh, it just it six you know seven days a week, you know. We lived on the facility there. So I start bringing, uh, you know, it was Dressage Barn, and I start bringing in Dressage trainers. Uh, you know, I had Charles De Comfy come in several times. Uh, Stephen Peters, I got to know really well. Met him on the road, and he came to the barn and did clinics, and uh, and I learned a lot from him. I, what I liked about Stephen, you know, we all talk about natural horsemanship, what you know, whatever that means, you know, it's, right. Uh, I think Pat coined that phrase, and I think what he meant by it is that, you know, um, like it's been talking about for a thousand years, you train the horse from the inside out. In other words, you, you know, you work with the mind. And uh, what I liked about him is because in the Western world, we think of natural horse shit. But what I liked about him is not only was he a fabulous rider, he he taped his Grand Prix level horses, the fourth level horses, and they're all looking good. He get on him, and and just and the whole world changed. Yeah, you know, I mean, it just it was phenomenal these horses. But there was something really unique that I grabbed a hold of, and it really made sense to the rest of my philosophy that I was kind of learning all through that journey. He says, I make the correction and I leave him alone, you know. So I, I, I'd see if the horse was behind the leg, a little lazy to it. He, he'd ask and then send that horse for him. Make the correction and leave him alone. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, you, you know, you learn from everyone. You know, I mean, I could watch, I could watch you. I could watch the trainer down the street. Uh, I, I love watching people work horses. You know, some of it. Some people make it look like it's an art and it flows and, you know, some people are awkward at it, but they have a lot of good things about it, but they just haven't got to the fluidness of it yet, you know? Right. And uh, so it's always interesting watching people work horses, you know? It's, it's you know, I go watch 
Uh, for a while, I was really interested in learning how to do, the, you know, the pee off. So I'd go watch guys that do nothing but specialize in, you know, the pee off and the passage. And you're wondering, well, what's a Western guy, you know? <laughs> uh, you know, want to learn that. And to me, I, I like to learn anything. You know, when I was in school, uh, I never did well because I was too busy looking out the window thinking about surfing or riding horses. <laughs> right. You know? And uh, and so you know my world of education has always been you know horses and and uh, I was in the automotive world and and actually quite successful at it but the horses was always my world so I I always wonder how they did that I I had sometimes you have your version you know what I mean yeah yeah and and you think that version is pretty good and is working for you and you go watch someone else. And you go, darn, I like that, you know? <laughs> right. And, and it's just, usually it's just a different twist. Yeah, yeah. You know, sure. there's a lot of similarities. I mean, if you think about it, it all the Western trainers and all the Joe Oz trainers, we're, we're all wanting to do the same thing, you know? And uh, if you think about it, the cues that we're trying to put on the horse and make them soft and light and responsive is what we're all trying to achieve. You know, you the horses, you know, when people, uh, I, I work with a, a couple of dressage riders now here in Aiken, and uh, uh, and their husband started working with me. He says, you know Western dressage? And I said, sure, I can do cowboy dressage, Western dressage. I says, it's horsemanship, you know, it's mm-hmm. equitation. Mm-hmm. Either the horse moves off your leg or it doesn't. Either the horse is a happy horse or it's not. Either the horse stops or he's not. You know yeah, what I mean? right, right. So the cues are all the same. There, there's some slight twist inversions in how we ride them in any event. But you know, you don't ride a dressage horse down the center line, you know, at top speed and do a slide stop for 20, 25, 30 feet, or whatever the case may be. Right. But. What I do with some of these big warm bloods, I get them so they're sucking the butt to the ground. Now, what would happen is out of that, the rider, the owner, would know how to ask for that, per se, even though it's not that hard. When they come to a stop, that horse would stop square and stop from the rear, in the right. box. Right. And he'd almost square himself, almost automatically. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, so, you know, we're all kind of wanting the same thing. So what we want is the horse to be light and responsive, light to our age. You know, it reminds me of a story. I I was training the horse for a good friend of mine, and uh, and she's she's wanting to sell it. And uh, I I like it. In fact, I think I did a video or something on her. And it was a nice mare, sorrel mare. And... uh, it's got to be very responsive, just a light touch and very soft in the face and and giving and you could put it any kind of frame you want depending on the discipline, you know. And she says, I got some, and she's wanting to sell it. So I said, okay, I'm interested. <clears throat> but the price that she wanted for it, I got, nah, you know, I'll walk on that. So another trainer that she knew uh, took the horse in uh, said they had a client who might be interested. So they ended up having that horse for almost six weeks. And finally, uh, we got the horse back, and apparently whoever was, was wanted, didn't want it, you know, uh, the first few days, actually, that it was there. But they get the horse, and they let everybody in the world ride it. I got the horse back, and I couldn't believe what I had under me. And I had the dullest, non-responsive horse that I think I've had, I've had in a long time. I mean, we all had some dull, non-responsive horses. But, you know, between me and the fence post and your audience, I got two sp- sets of spurs. I have a set of spurs that's very, they, you know, they're bigger well, but, you know, they're, they're very gentle. I mean, they're about the size of a half dollar, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And uh, and then I call what my cookie cutters were. You know, I, I get them, and 
they had a little bite to them. And, uh, and this horse wouldn't respond to that, you know? Hmm. And so I found out a little bit about it because uh, my uh, a uh, friend of mine, an uh, acquaintance I knew, knew the trainer. And they said, well, what they do is if the horse wouldn't move off the leg, they just add more leg. I go, what do you mean more leg? They just press harder. Yeah, yeah. And I go, which is very common in the industry. Mm-hmm. I mean, in any discipline, you right. know, you just, you know, take that heel and that little stubby spur or whatever they got, and they just kind of push, you know, until the leg hurts, and the horse still does or does not move. But usually, at that point, they hardly move at all. And then you get to a point you're saying, oh, you know, you got the the owner, or the, it, you're the frame of mind you're in is, I hope you will, I hope you will, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I saw a horse that was a really nice horse that was spoiled. And and she said to me, I said, you want to buy the horse? And I go, no. I says, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an offer you can't refuse. I said, no, I don't want the horse. The horse is ruined. You know, this, this horse got dulled down so bad, it got... It got dead in the eye. In other words, the, the spirit of the horse left. You know what I mean? Yeah. It got you know, broken spirited. And I said, listen, I, I, I rescue horses all the time. This would be a nice little horse for uh, mama or husband horse, you know, that, you know, they don't want to do a whole lot of stuff. They can just go down the trail. Right. And what I'm saying is, what a shame, you know. And, and this is what some of the things that I learned from, you know, Stephen Peters, you know, make a correction, make sure the horse moves off your leg and then leave them alone, yep. you know. Yep, get in and get out. Get in and get out, you know, yeah. not just a little pecking, you know. So these are things that you can learn from people, little things that people have that, uh, you know, that you, you are familiar with, but they got a twist or something to it that, makes a lot more sense, mm. you know? And, and which, what it does, it makes your horsemanship even better. And in the long run, it's always better for the horse. I mean, that's what it's all about. You know, you don't, yeah. you don't like in the old days, you know, uh, you know, it's kick and spur, you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> and, and jerk, I mean, that's how I grew up, you mm-hmm. know? And uh, in fact, I grew up solving problems uh, for example, my guardian, he used to buy horses, uh, you know, anywhere from Arizona on through New Mexico and Texas. He'd buy a truck and trailer because one of the things he did, he had the standing stud service and he showed, but the other thing he did was he sold, bought and sold horses. Well, he'd buy these horses out of the auction, but, you know, time you get them picked up and they go into, you know, you know, trailers and time you get here, you don't know what you got. So right. guess what this fifteen year old teenager did? <laughs> what my job was. You were you were the crash dummy, you know, huh? Find out. <laughs> <laughs> they bucked or ran away or they were a nice horse or you know, I've had them jump over the feeders, jump over a five foot fence and oh <laughs> you know. But back then you did, you know, you was a kid and you giggle and boy, what a lot of fun, you know. <laughs> But we had this one horse, and uh, it it came in, and everything, you know, you get on, and all of a sudden, come along, find it, stop, and rear up, you know. So we tried everything. We we tried the, you know, rubber hose between the ears that had come up, you know, and bop it on the head. And we tried the, the balloons, break it, you know, the horse is getting light feet. You take the balloon, break it over head, make it feel like it's blood or something, you know. Uh, we tried, if it rare enough, step off and pull them over backwards, you know. And, uh, you know, we tried all of that stuff, you know. Yeah. And uh, and so, uh, one time, uh, this is what I was telling you earlier, I don't, what I do behind the barn, I do in front of people, but I want to, what I'm telling the audience and you, you know, here I am a, you know, 15, 16 year old kid. So what I did is I took a, a two by two up on board. I had to use the rubber hose because that's what you know I was told to do. Mm-hmm. And I used this two by four, 
And uh, when the horse came off the ground, I used it between the ears. Now, the thing was, that horse dropped like a sack of potatoes, and 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 I just barely got off of that horse in time. And it, and this was an area that made big changes in my life, even at a young age. And uh, and I thought I killed that horse. Yeah. But within a few minutes, the you know, eyes opened, you know, and you know, kind of rolled his eyes back before and opened his eyes and shook his head and got up. Mm-hmm. And that really made a big impact on me. Uh, and I uh, and I realized back then. I mean, shoot, uh, I'm 73 and I was 15. Uh, gee, uh, you know, not quite 60 years ago. You know, I was thinking of this stuff, and and I knew something. Had to, had to be different, yeah. you know? Because I've gone through all the other stuff. Now I get ran horses in, and I, you can usually figure out what the owner's been doing, to, you know, <laughs> right. by what the horse is doing, you know? <laughs> right, for uh, sure. Because now you're more, a lot more in touch with this uh, uh, natural behavior. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you, you know what, what people do to push that horse in that position. Not knowing, you know, not knowingly doing it. Sure. Just lack of knowledge. Yep. And so what I found about 30 years ago, uh, actually a little long, yeah, about 30 years ago, when I started doing problem horses, you know, back then no one was doing problem horses. Now I'm betting the world's doing it. Right. But uh, I used to try to fix the problem where the problem was at. And what I realized, the only way I could fix the problem is start from the beginning. Yeah. It didn't make any difference what the horse knew or didn't know. You had to start from the beginning. Was he halted or broke? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. What right. was his attitude? Did he have a good work ethic? You know, and if he didn't have a good work ethic, he had to teach him a work ethic. You know, something that, that he could do. Something was easy. You know, sometimes... Just round pinning the horse is easy, you know, Right. Uh, for them to learn, you know, or teaching the horse to lunge, you know, on a, on a shorter line. Uh, and then you build from that, you know, can he lead? Well, no, he wants to walk all over you, you know, so you fix that. And then, because I used to tell clients, listen, I'm going to, I know your horse got a 25 foot slide. And I get that he's got a good turnaround on him, but we're going to start with the groundwork. And what do you mean? I spent thousands of dollars with such and such down in Southern California. I said, I get it, you know. I see you spin this horse. He's got it, but Mm -hmm. he's got a problem. We've got to find out where that is, where it started. Mm -hmm. And then we just, you know, climb the ladder, and pretty soon we're riding it. But usually what happens, you stumble along the, the trigger, whatever the problem is and then you fix then you fix the trigger you don't fix the symptom you know right exactly and that's that's what i learned because when people start you know people when i started doing problem horses it was like my horse won't stand still to mount well that's easy you know mm-hmm. <laughs> my horse won't stand still to mounting block as i got more recognized in the industry you know, pretty soon I get horses shipped from Texas, the East Coast, you know, of course the problems get bigger and bigger, right? Right. And, uh, and, and of course before that, I start real, that's when I start realizing, uh, the other thing I had to realize is I had to solve the problem. It's like taking your car in to get it fixed. You got this rattle in the back seat, you know, or in the trunk, you know, and you take it into mechanic. And you explain to him, and you know, you drop off the car, and you come back, and uh, you know, the uh, the rattle is still there, and they said, "Well, I can't find it." Right. So it's the same thing with horses. So you you can't on the horse, you can't fix it until you know what the problem is. You know what I mean? You got, or you got to bring the problem up so you can fix it, type of thing. Right. And so what I learned to do. Uh, uh, is I, I set them up to fail. In other words, I I look for ways that would set that problem off. 
Sure. And then so it I could come up. I could work sure. with it. Pardon? So that it would come up. So that so that you could see exactly what was taking place. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Because remember, the the car that owns the car. And there's a rattle, but you, you get there and you don't hear no rattle, so you play right. around with it. So you 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 set you set them up. To, you try to look for something that would set them up to to uh, for the problem to come up. So you know exactly what it is, mm -hmm. and when you know exactly what it is, then you can fix the problem. You know. It's for here is an example. You know, uh, the way that we was brought up and a lot of people was brought up, you know, he, and I'm sure you heard too. You know, I've been riding for 25 years, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't need to be trained on my horse. All right. I want to do is go out there and ride my horse yep. on the trail. Yep, I just want to I just want to enjoy it. I just want to ride him. Yeah, I just want to enjoy it, you yep. know. Well, at the same time, the horse is coming back and it's running back home even though it's got a spade bit in its mouth and it, and the nose is between the legs and the horse is still running off. They go, "Well, I don't want to train my horse. I just want to enjoy it." Well, yep. You got a problem. <laughs> okay, yep. you're gonna have to learn to start riding this horse, and I can fix it. But uh, but if you don't learn how to do this, I'll guarantee you, by the second ride, you're gonna have the same problem. Right. You know, and and they'd come back, and you know, by the second, third ride, yep. You know, so <clears throat> the thing is, do here. This is what I'm trying to get to. If you know the horse is spooky out there and not comfortable on the trail and things come up the boogeyman or the alligator with the big teeth, you know, or the branch has got, you know, big teeth, you know, would you better solve the problem at home, you know, where you have a comfortable and a safe environment? Right. Or are you going to try to fix the problem out there in the trail? You have no control of his nose. If he backs up, can you control him backing up? Otherwise, you're going to go over, you know, that 100-foot cliff that mm -hmm. you was concerned about. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so what you do, you work on some of these problems as they come up. So, uh, so I know if a horse, I know a horse is, all horses can spook. And I'm sure you know that. Most people know that. Sure. So I find things that pushes their buttons, and then we work through the problem. So if I'm out there on the trail, in fact, I'm working with uh, this uh, dressage lady working on her uh, horse that uh, hadn't even started cantering. She's had the horse since she was five years old, and the horse is 15, and hasn't really done any canter, and the horse really doesn't know how to canter. And certainly, when the horse went on the trail, it was really not fun. So I said, well, have you worked on, you know, de-spooking? Have you worked on, you know, working through things? So like yesterday, day before yesterday, uh, she lives at a place called Three Runs. And if anybody's listening, it's from from area with South Carolina. Three Runs is a big horse community, beautiful horse community. And they're all five or ten acre, you know, lots. And a friend of theirs is uh, cutting down some trees and clearing land so they can have pasture. Because here in South Carolina, we have a lot of pine trees. <laughs> yes. I mean, yes. It, it just grows like a bad weed, you know what I mean? <laughs> Uh, and, and it's all good. I like to look at it, Adam. You know, I, right. I'm used to looking at tall redwood trees because I lived, you know, in California. It's a nice change here of scenery. We got tall pine trees, you know, and it's majestic. So anyway, so she, I show up, and uh, she's supposed to have her horse warmed up and you know riding. And I show up, and she's still lunging. I said, "Well, what's going on?" Well, they're clearing land there. The horse doesn't like the sound of the of the uh, uh, the chainsaw and, and the tractor and the trees falling. And and I said, oh, what a beautiful training opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yes. And she looked at me and I go, this, let, let me explain. When, when I live in California, and I, there's two expos there, the southern one and the northern one. And every time I was asked, if, if I only needed one horse and if I could get four or five other horses out with me, I took them with me 
because in the warm-up ring, there's uh, carriages, wagons, mm -hmm. you know, the, the clanking of the harness and the thumping of the, the carriage. And, you know, you're they're coming up behind you and it's scaring the bejeebies out of the horse because it's never right. heard that before. Right. You know, it's that flight instinct, you know, kicking in. I says, what's, what's going on now? I can't buy that situation. Right, you know? exactly. You can't recreate that experience anywhere you, I else. I can't re recreate that one. You know, right. I can recreate the, the chainsaw, you know, yep. I can get a, a blower out, you know, we can get that, but the tree falling and the big tractors going on, you know, I, I, I can't do that. I said, you got a beautiful opportunity. I said, think about it. Because she goes, well, I don't think I want to ride today. And I go, well, you don't have to ride today, you know, but why don't we take advantage of this opportunity and get it adjusted to it, you know, mm -hmm. get comfortable with it. And uh, I said, because look at what might happen. I said, what if you was on this beautiful trail that you got available here? And you come up, and someone just fires up a chainsaw, and it goes, Ring, you know, and the horse spins and runs off, you know? Yes. What are you going to do, you know? Has anybody even showed you how to control the nose so the horse doesn't bolt down the trail? <laughs> or why don't we go ahead and take care of that problem and get him adjusted to those kind of sights and sounds? I lived in another town called Woodside in, in uh, California in the West Bay. And everybody always wanted to ride the horse in the woodside downtown. They had hitching posts. Uh -huh. You know what I did with most of the horses they had in training? To learn to go downtown. Yeah, for traffic, sure. You know? Right, right. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so anyway, she goes, oh, yeah, that makes sense, you know. So we ended up spending the back about a half hour. I, I said, listen, okay, she's fresh. She hadn't ridden her for a couple of days. Let's lunge her, Okay. And then what we're going to do is lunge her, and we'll get her going forward, and we'll get her, you know, to get some freshness off her, and then we'll get her to stop her feet, we'll change directions. And then when we're doing that, when she starts getting comfortable a little bit, you know, closer, I mean, where we are, we'll start working our way down towards the end of the arena where most of the noise was. And so, anyway, so without dragging the story out, what happened, I, I got the horse all the way down to the bottom of the arena, down the hill, and still there's trees and we can't get to the tractor or the chainsaw, but she was happy, the horse, you know, she wasn't mm -hmm. trying to bolt or anything. Mm -hmm. And the neck started relaxing and the whole nine yards. And so I said, listen, we got a few minutes left, she's been working hard, she's been lunging, I said, why don't we just get on and, and walk her and we can do some exercise at a walk. He says, she, she looks at me and says, what well, do you think so? I go, look at the horse. The horse has the bottom line. Right. The horse had dropped his neck down and relaxed, had the soft eye. The chainsaws are going off, you know, in the distance, didn't bother her a bit. Mm -hmm. I said, well, what do you think? She says, sounds good to me. So we got on and walked around, you know, I told her, you know, only about 20 minutes because we already worked her pretty good. Mm -hmm. And then we ended up doing some trot work and, you know, and I ended up having to go down the other end of the arena between the walk and trot work, you know. So, you know, when, so there's things that we can do to set horses up, you know, like I can set horses up by having a chainsaw there or a leaf blower, you know, that's like a chainsaw. Uh, or, uh, you know, other things, golf carts, I've done clinics where we had golf carts running around, you know. So we can set them up for that kind of thing, but there's those things that come up that you can't, like you described, you, you can't, you can't set up that scenario again. I right. mean, that's, that's, that's huge, you right. know. Right. It's like, oh, that, that's gold, that's gold. Absolutely, you know? absolutely. Yeah. I think for a lot of people, that's a big perspective shift though you know yeah, uh, if they're not if they're not in a situation where they're used to working with horses in those conditions or or they're under kind of deadlines like you say at the expos and things like that the horse just has to be okay with that because the horse is your partner yeah. in the presentation and that sort of thing without people having that perspective it can be a big challenge for them because I mean, let's face it, avoidance is a natural tendency for all of us, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, 
have there's a problem comes up even if it's not horses we have a tendency to avoid it go around it you know run sure. from her to bury our heads you know right right but yeah and and the other thing is then then she's had trainers and big trainers say well we just won't ride today she told me that after her sister uh her sister was there she says charles her you know what her trainers other trainers would say well, it's just not a good day to ride. Yeah. I go, are you kidding? <laughs> it's the best. You know? <laughs> That's the best day to ride. <laughs> yeah, it, it, you know, you don't have, I'm not, I'm not wanting you to get on the horse and go down there and cowgirl up, you know. I mean, you know, we, we quit doing that stuff, you know, a long time ago, you right. know. But there's, there's ways that we can get them to get used to that kind of situation. So like I said, when you got a horse expo, listen, you got, you know, I've, like you, I've had to walk down through whatever through stuff, you know. Absolutely. And, 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 you're, and, and you're going, okay, Tenny, you know, <laughs> you've always brought me through before, but this is a new one. And right. And I handle this one, you know. That's it, right? You go, you go past the the clown making the balloon animals and the popcorn yeah, stand yeah, and yeah. and it pops, you know. <laughs> yeah, and, you know absolutely. And you get the crowds around it, you know. I right. Mean, if you got a season horse, that's not a big deal, but right, you know, that can be quite a situation. Horse, you know? <laughs> yeah. 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 So you know, my philosophy is uh, it doesn't matter what discipline it's. Let's get that horse trained. Uh, I like to use the term broke, but I guess, you know, that's not a correct term these days. That's right. Uh, yeah. But in my terms, a broke horse is a pleasure to ride. He's got a work ethic. He's happy. He's a happy horse. Uh, you know, it's it's just the kind of horse that everybody wants, you know. Right. And that, it's a happy horse. Right, right. Well, and that's that's a horse that has emotional control over himself exactly. right I think yeah. I feel like that's a big difference with with a lot of these horses that we might call you know uh, quote unquote broke versus the ones that maybe we would call not quite uh, they have emotional stability right you know and I think a lot of that right. is because of those experiences because of the opportunities to present them with those experiences just get them out there and get them exposed yeah, like uh, I uh, not too long ago, I did a new uh, DVD on despooking, and uh, one of my clients had uh, bought a uh, rain cow horse uh, from a friend of mine, you know, and it, it, was, it had some good training on it, and, uh, you know, there's always something you could do with it, you know, tighten it up, you know, but I used it for the video because in the arena, you know, doing cow work, going down the fence, this, this mare was bold, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, bold, you know, I mean, it pulled, pulled right into a cow, and, you know, it didn't bother it a bit, but take it outside the arena, you know, they're snorting, uh, <laughs> you yep, know, yep. They, they wouldn't know how to go on the trail, you know, forever, mm -hmm. you know, but... They, they don't have to, you know, I mean, you know, a lot of people don't do that. They just stick to the arena. Right. But here's something else, and I'm sure you, you probably come across it. You, you seem to be very versified. The the thing is, that I've, I've had a friend of mine come up to uh, Southern California and work with me to uh, get his raining down and the rain cowers down. And he said, the trainer I work down there with says, doesn't want me to take my horse, you know, out on the trail. You know, don't do that. That horse only knows arena stuff. Yeah. And I said, well, that's really a shame. Because says, number one, a lot of problems with horses are, they're just arena are. That's all they do. They turn mm -hmm. around, they slide, they change leads, and, you know, do a bunch of circle work. You know, I mean, how right. boring is that? You know? Right. You know, at least getting out on the trail. I mean, if you're going to do arena work, well, get some trot poles out there. Oh, no, that's English. <laughs> well, guess get a Cavaletti out there, you know. Ride it over Cavaletti, you know what I mean? Back it through some poles, you know, pretend it's a trail horse. Oh, no, you know. How about when you go on the trail, how about, you know, I said there's a lot of things you can do on the trail. In fact, I got to tell you this real quick. When I bought this place, 
I, it was perfect. It was perfect. And it was in the bottom of the canyon, and, and you took this trail, and since then, I took and had a, a, a D4, I guess, whatever they are, you know, and, and make it about 10 feet wide, you know, and to wind up. And you could see four of the bridges of the Bay Area, you know, it was a real treat. Wow, wow. But the problem was there wasn't a whole lot of stuff that you could do. You couldn't change directions, you couldn't mm. circle around. Because I was used to being in the West Bay in uh, uh, Petrola Valley uh, and, and a game preserve there where they just, you know, probably a 30 foot wide strip, you know, and you could try, uh, you yeah. could canter in circles. Mm -hmm. it, it was great, you know. Right. And, and and then I had this hill I had to go up and down. I go, oh my God, you know, I can't do anything, you know. Well, what I found, I had a gym here and I didn't know it. So the horses, you know, that wanted to race back home, you know, my normal exercise, I couldn't execute real well because the limited room. But, it, but it's amazing how I can work on haunches in. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, leg yields, <laughs> you know. Yep. Uh, and, and I just keep doing it, switching hips to the right, you know, having, you know, half that, you know, after the hip starts getting better, do a half pass, you know, even if it's one or two steps, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and then, and then here's another thing that, that was a benefit. Everyone thinks, and I don't know your feelings on it, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, but everyone thinks that if a horse is out in pasture and it's got heels, it's going to develop its hind end. Or if they trot up the hill, you know, they're going to develop the hind end. Or they walk up the hill, but they want to go into a trot, you know, and they let, usually let them go. And the whole idea is to build up the hind end using mm -hmm. the hill work. Right. The problem is they're coming from the front end. Right. They're pulling themselves up the hill. Right. But, you know, I read an article not too long ago. It was a bill racer. And uh, she says, yeah, I, I work on my horses, and uh, what I do is take them up the hill. And so they showed a picture of a hill, they got a tie down on the horse, you know. Yeah. And, you know, and the leverage bit, and the mouth is gapped, and they're going up the hill, you know. Well, there's no way the horse is going to, you know, come from the hind end or engage the hind end, you know. Right. He's all stressed out in the front end. The more he gags, the head goes up the more the heavier on the front end, you know? Right, right. So what I learned, what, you know, another gym, you know, was, God, I can teach his horses how to go uphill and push. Mm -hmm. And I had this one horse I had for sale, and the woman came out to ride it, and she loved the horse. But as we was going up the hill, she was with one of my trainers, and she stopped and asked the trainer, says, is there something wrong with this horse? It feels funny. And Sam, uh, she, her name was Samantha, but it, we all called her Sam. And uh, she, she says, no, she's just pushing from behind, and what you're feeling is, you know, the push from behind and using the right. back. Right. And she goes, oh, I never felt that before. <laughs> it felt completely <laughs> wrong because it was so foreign. Yeah, it was just foreign, you know. I mean, yeah. it's a foreign movement, you know. Yes. And then downhills. And this is great for, uh, and you probably figured this out too, is going downhill, I have, I get horses to slide downhill, mm -hmm. you know, or if, if it's capable, sure. because they get the butt under them, you know, because right. what happens, it, it, they, they start going down a normal hill, and, and all of a sudden they got these little short steps, and yes. I call it short step in it. Mm -hmm. And but they're not you know flat footing it out and free flowing you know so what I learned to do is I throw them out into a trot and then do a half halt bring them back and mm -hmm. then they do that little short step again I ask them go into a trot do a half halt and then bring them back to a walk and all of a sudden they're flat you know footing it out in other words they're really walking out right exactly because. I had to learn to do that because a lot of the people, like in Mount Diablo, there's a big, in, that, in the Livermore area, a lot of cattle ranches out there, and these guys are, they got a canter downhill, you know, 
you got to trot down the hill. You know, if you got a horse that can't even walk down the hill, they ain't going to do them any good. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, these, these are fun things, you know, that you kind of learn along the way that, you know, that, that, you know, makes the horse a little bit better. You know, I mean, what more could be better from the horse than, than the horse is, uh, be balanced? Because when they use a nine in, they're just going to be a nice balanced horse. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And there are so many opportunities, like you said, out on the trail. It doesn't have to be uh, secluded in the arena to help the horse learn how to work from the haunches, how to come through from yeah. behind, how to use its back. Uh, yeah. Those, yeah, I, I find a lot of times those arena situations are more meaningful to the horse anyway because they can see the purpose. Yeah. Well, that's like getting a slide down the hill. So all of a sudden your slides are better, you know. Right. Because they've learned to drop that hip down, you know, because they had to do that. Because I, I, I wouldn't let them off the hook. I mean, you're not going to get it the first couple, two or three times. But maybe five or six times, they realize, oh, it's it's better for me just to tuck my haunches in and drop that butt down and slide and travel with the front end, you know? Right. You know, so there's so many things that you could do out there that uh, in your arena work that could really make it work for you a lot. I had... Uh, one of the things that I did, I was, for a while, I was doing, uh, I own property in, in Missouri, and uh, a long time ago, I don't, I don't know if you remember this, uh, there was a thing in Missouri called Ride with the Stars. Yes, I do remember that, in the, um, it, what, yeah. what, in the, in the Adirondacks out there? Yeah, it was, uh, it was, uh, uh, kind of a guest ranch type thing, you know, and, uh, People come in and ride, and it was beautiful property. You know, Pat Pirelli was there, Clinton Anderson, when he was just getting started, and Pat. And mm -hmm. I was invited there a couple of times. It was really neat because, and you just people could just roam around and you know ask questions, and that's why they call it Ride with the Stars. Of course, they had to pay a lot of money, you know, to come and do that. You know, but where else could you go and sit down and have breakfast or lunch with? You know, Pat Pirelli or Clinton Anderson. Right, right. You know, or, you know, Charles Wilhelm or, you know, Patrick, you know, as far as that goes, you know. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and just kind of shoot the breeze a little bit. And, and that was a neat deal. And uh, that, that happened for three or four years, but then uh, that's another story. But anyway, but I used to do clinics out there and... Uh, what was neat about it is, uh, you know, I had great opportunities out there, but I, I'd see people come out there and they, uh, you know, I don't want to mention names, but, you know, Pirelli people, you know, they want to ride bridleless. Listen, I've been riding bridleless for the last probably 40 years, and but but my horse is really broke. <laughs> you right. know what I mean? <laughs> um, but... And I'm just gonna say there, Charles. I'm I'm just gonna say you didn't do a very good job of not dropping names there or not naming names. Oh, good. I, 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 but you know, it's it's okay. It's okay when when it comes to well, when it comes no to these discussions, it's just reality. Well, there's no knock to it in a sense. It right. Way sure. Because they they get excited about the horse and they they, yes. they found that they could learn to ride bridleless. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So they pull in, and here's this whole terrain, different kind of terrain they're used to. Right. And they're out there trying to ride bridleless. Well, all of a sudden, they're getting in trouble because the horses uh, not adapted that kind of environment because Absolutely. they never exposed them to that kind right. of environment. And that comes right back to the exposure that we were talking about with the expos and exactly. the chainsaws. Now yeah, they, sure, sure. Now, what they could have done, if they were fairly broke horses, as we've been talking about, what I would do if it's a new area and I don't think my horse, you know, you have to be smart, you know, you can't let your eagle get out ahead of you. What right. I would do, I'd take my horse out in the hackamore and a bridle and go make a, you know, go through the trails and see what mm -hmm. I'm up against, you know what I mean? Right, and exactly. Then if I felt comfortable, my horse felt comfortable, I could take him bridleless, but at least... You know, I'm trying to be smart about it, you know. Right. Well, you've got to have the preparation. It's a smart thing to do. Yes. Yes. You've got to have the preparation. Yeah. 
preparation, always a preparation. Hmm. Yeah. And that's where people, I tell people, uh, I, and I'm sure in a way you do too, you have to put the work in the front end. What I mean for that is the horses have to learn certain basic training. And it requires work and effort from the owner. And it requires consistency, which makes it even more difficult. And sometimes you have to be outright tenacious, you know. And you have to be willing to make some corrections, you know. Yes. And, and of course, that word is a big burger, you know, with people. <laughs> Correction doesn't mean a ball bat or two before right. like I did on a horse, you know. Right. But if the horse, here's something I learned a long time ago, I, leading, you know, growing up and, uh, you know, all the guys, you know, the, uh, the philosophy was if you're going to be the leader, then the horse needs to follow you. Yes. And I agree with that. I really did until the third time the horse ran over me. <laughs> and then I said, in philosophy, it's good, but in actuality, it sucked. <laughs> and so what I did was I, I started teaching my horses to lead next to me. Mm -hmm. So I was just in front of the shoulders, you know, so I could see the ears. Because what happened on these other horses is something will frighten them from the back. They don't care if you're standing in front of them. You know, people say, well, they don't want to hurt you. They don't want to run over you. Baloney, you know, <laughs> when that flight instinct kicks yeah. in, they don't care if it's a barbed wire fence. Right. They don't even know? see it in those moments. They don't even see it. That adrenaline right. is going. They don't know this traffic on the road that they're you're going to go cross as you know there's traffic back and forth they don't know that they don't know if it's a pavement where they hit the road and slide and slip and slide and get a, a road burn on their left hip because they traveled about 20 feet because they were going it fast right you know they, they don't know that you know so you know and for a while i'd be at the the horse expos and then i hear the guys who's leading who you know some of the guys you know and I said, well, I'm actually leading him. I, in fact, he's, it's his job to stay up with me, you right. know. So it's, it's these kind of things, you know. The philosophy was good, but the actuality, you know, is, is not necessarily good, you know. So <laughs> these are hard lessons that you've learned and I've learned and, you know, through the ways and, yeah, you know, I used to tell the people at the barn, and you know, I tell them a lot of things. You don't want to do this because such and such. And he said, "Well, how do you know that? Because been there, done that." You sure, know? right? Experience. To me. Yeah. yeah. How do you think I know? You know. Yeah. <laughs> Not a good idea. Absolutely. Well, that experience is such a big thing, and you know, being in the industry as a professional, we, you and I, and and everybody else who's a professional, we're very fortunate in that we get to experience a lot of things. You know, but I know sure. you've spent many years on the road teaching clinics. I'm now full time on the road teaching clinics. I I think I work with probably about 200 different horses every month. That's more than yeah. most amateur yeah. owners. And when I say amateur, I simply mean not professionals. Uh, it's right. more than most amateur owners will work with in their entire lifetime with horses. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the experience that comes yeah. from that is yeah. is priceless. So actually, priceless. On, that, on that road, on that train of thought, um, that brings me to a question. What would you say you've had as maybe your biggest life lesson in your experience from all the horses that you've worked with? If there's if there's something that stands out as being like the biggest lesson you could say you've had or the biggest philosophical shift, what would that be? Well, I could tell you, this was a, a gray mare. Uh, you, couldn't, yeah, you couldn't hardly get close to a saddle. It always bucked when you try to cinch it. Uh, it, if you try to bridle it, it just sling his head and co cock you. Uh, there was a lot of stuff going on with this horse. And I'll try to keep it short because I know we're going on and there <laughs> no worries. maybe some of the audience might want some questions. But uh, what I, the, the big turnaround for me is this, is that what would happen, 
and I get this horse going, and um, and we're making progress, and then we'd always kind of fall backwards. And 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 all, a lot of horses do that, but not this mare. I mean, it, it just when you think you're on top of the world, you you know you just got your old chest puffed up, you know, <laughs> this mare would slide backwards. And and to the point that. I, usually when a horse is brought in to me, I, uh, I had a few horses that were in training all the time that we showed, but most of the horses that came in for training were, I tell people most of the time, the reality is your horse is going to be here at least three months, period. I don't care how smart your horse is, it's going to be at least three months. Mm -hmm. That's for your average horse, average problem, blah, blah. Your tougher horses five to six months. And I had this mare for three months and it was doing good. You could put the bridle on, uh, we went through all the ear thing and didn't have her, I mean, this horse is really dangerous about the ears, really dangerous. And I mean, we all had these ear problems on horses and some worse than others, but this was huge. And we do fine, and then I had it. We could put a saddle on. I mean, you go up to it, you could actually cinch it up, and you know, not explode. And then, and then all of a sudden, and we was right at the three months, thinking that this horse is going to go home. And then this horse blew up again, and I go, oh, "That's what I'm going to do. What I'm going to tell the client." Right. Know? So anyway, the client came because she was scheduled to come in. I said, listen, I said, I, 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 I kind of have my hands wet here. And I says, that we've had the manager really good. And she, and she knew she was coming and being involved in it, you know. So it's, it's not like she never saw the horse or got involved. I said, this mare, you know, went backwards again. And I thought we had this solid. And I says, I need this horse for another month. I need it for another month. And and she said, oh, okay, whatever you think, you know. And what I learned out of this, in that month, we went through more hurdles, some more emotional drama. Uh, because a lot of these things, one of my clients is a uh, psychiatrist, you know, and, and so it's easy to talk about stuff like this because it's just people the same thing. People got baggage, horses got baggage, you know. And, sure. and what I learned out of this is because she spent another month and, and in that month we went through a lot more baggage, some other things that came up, there other trigger points. And what happened is that horse left and it came back two years later but it didn't come back from any of those two issues. Came back for something else. And she and it just started developing. She knew how to bring it and get it nipped in the bud. Mm. And what I learned about that is not to give up. Yeah. Uh -huh. Not to give up. There's there's a way through. Now I, I on 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 the back of that I, I'll tell you there's been a half a dozen horses that I consider non-trainable. In fact, that was a big deal for me, That because I always thought all horses trainable. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I've come across some horses that are just not trainable, period. Either because lack of oxygen to the brain, like uh, one horse that, that came in, I used to do, she did running quarter horses, and she'd bring all of her the horses to me okay. and uh, get a walk, trot and canter in and bathing and all that stuff. And then she'd go to the her race trainer and just had to teach it to go fast. And uh, I thought I had the best job, but, you know, <laughs> but, it, <laughs> but anyway, uh, she brought this one horse in and she really liked this horse. And, and, and about two weeks I called her up and I said, you need to pick this horse up. She says, well, what's wrong? And I said, this horse is not trainable. 
there's something going on with it, you know, uh, because I, I would work with her for four or five days, take two days off, you know, not work it with a couple of days. And I come back and we literally almost start from zero. Mm -hmm. And finally, after two weeks, I said, uh, I, I, I think I could go on, but I, I, I I don't think I'd feel good. I feel like I'd be taking your money. Yeah. And, and I, I'm not a person that gives up. I, I, you know, I'm I'm a German. I just I'm like a pit bull. <laughs> you know, I just don't let it go. You know, that's my bone, and I'm not going anywhere. Right. And 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 so anyway, she goes because I said, you know, I, it feels almost like there's uh, uh, maybe something at birth or. Uh, a lack of uh, blood supply to the brain or something. She says, oh yeah, it was, she goes, oh yeah, it was at Davis and the, uh, the, uh, uh, what do you call it? The, the, uh, they had a line going to the neck for, you know, IV line. Oh, okay. And uh, it collapsed and, uh, and she couldn't, you know, there was no oxygen going to no the brain. No kidding. Wow. Yeah. And I said, well, that's, that's exactly what's happened. Yeah. Is, it was a kind horse, so it's not like it was a killer horse or anything. Mm -hmm. Thank it just goodness. couldn't learn anything, mm -hmm. you know. So she just took it home and made it a pasture horse, you know. Mm -hmm. And I had another one that uh, a fella, he ended up buying and uh, brought it to me. I had worked with his couple of horses with him before. He bought it. He was in... Bob, he was in financially good shape, and he bought this horse, and I said, oh, I, you need to do something with this horse. It took me forever to catch this horse, and, and he about tore the trailer up trying to get the horse in there with a bunch of guys trying to get him in. <clears throat> and I worked with him, and I worked with him for three months, and then I said, listen, we're making progress, but it's been real slow a lot slower and I'm feeling kind of like I'm taking your money. And I told him, I said, listen, there's other guys out there, you know, you, you wouldn't hurt my feelings if you didn't think I was up to the task and you wanted to take him someplace. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have a problem with it. And I don't have a problem to you know, continue working with him, this horse. And she says, no, I, I, you know, I, I know if anybody's going to get her done, you're going to get her done. So, uh, you know, a month later, I called him up and I said, this horse is not trainable. It is not trainable, you know. The problem is time, it was kind of the same thing as the other horse. We get better, it, we could get it further along. And uh, but it, it was always difficult playing, working with his feet. It, it was always difficult in trying to you know, get close to it. It, it was always, it always got better and better and better, but what he was going to do is just take it and turn it out. I, well, this is what I said. Be honest with your audience, and I'll probably get in trouble for this. I said, we can continue on, which I don't advise. You could turn him out to pasture, make his life wonderful, you know, but the problem is you're not going to be able to keep him bedded. You know, like getting feet trimmed or anything like that, and, and the only other option is having put down. Mm -hmm. Now I don't say that lightly because right. I've taken horses in that people tell them this this horse needs to put down. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a it's it's a rogue horse. I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard this, and how you know we can turn this and we turn this horse around. But I, I've, ne I've only said that once in my life. Mm -hmm. But this was a horse that just, he was not a happy camper. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, if he could put him out in pasture. And then I've had people say, well, gee, well, you know, when he just, let, you know, he didn't have to be vetted. You know, he didn't have his feet done before, and blah, 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 you know. I go, well, what if he breaks a leg? Yeah, you know exactly. I mean? The what if is around, such a you danger. Know? I mean, what to do, you know? Yeah. You're going to catch him, and you're going to try you, you got to get him so you can at least get him to a point where you can, you know, put him down because the leg's broken. Or if you got all the money in the world, you're going to spend a bunch of money putting the cash, and he's not going to handle that. Right. You know? 
you know, so this is reality sometimes, you know, and, and this is, you know, perception, you know, a lot of people don't want to look at, you know, but, right. and I don't either. I, like I said, I've only said that once. And, right. uh, and there's only been a few horses I said that's not trainable. And for, I can tell you years, and there's another thing that I, I changed my mind on. I, I always felt that uh, uh, everyone can train your own horse. I no longer say that or agree with that. Why is that? Well, there's some people that have basically uh, good common sense around horses and got the, the coordination and the, uh, the common sense and the uh, confidence to do it. You know, as you know, uh, you know, working with horses is you, you got to be comfortable working with equipment. I don't care if it's a lead, a lead line, mm -hmm. uh, you know, reins, you know, putting a saddle on, you know, uh, and some people just don't have those kind of skills. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, some people just don't have those kind of confidence, you know, uh, now. What they can do, what I suggest is, is that's a that's a pretty good percentage of people, uh, and I might get in trouble for that too. <laughs> but uh, what the what I suggest to people and and my clients is, you can continue enjoying your enjoying your horse, but you're going to need a trainer to work with your horse, you know, at least once a week. Because these are people that ridden when they were, you know, kids, went to college, uh, had a profession, had kids, and now they uh, in a position they got time and money, and you, you know, they're 55, 60 now. Mm -hmm. But they're just not comfortable around horses, and, and these are people that don't get to the barn often. Right, right. You know, so the horse is sitting around a couple of days, and uh, you know, I, and and I teach them how to lunge the horse around them to get their freshness off of them. You know, but here here's another perception of it. You know, I mean, I come out to the arena, and and everybody's kind of lunging the horse, and you know, they're all saddled. You know, they're trying to get them warmed up, and I go check in on them. And they got the horse in a cute little trot, you know, a cute little canter on the line, you know. And, and I say, did you guys check to see if there's any flight buttons there going on? Did you put any little bit of pressure on it? Oh, no, because he looks so good. <laughs> well, don't rock the boat, right? Up and ask him to pick up the gate a little stronger, a little more forward and see what happens. And, of course, then the horse kicks up, he goes charging around, you know, on the end of the line, I go, whoops, <laughs> right. there's that button, you know. Just imagine if you were on that, you know, and these are people don't get to ride much, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And and need someone like me or you or, or, or a local trainer in a barn to get on them once in a while and find out what's going on with it, mm -hmm. you know, reestablish the brakes. Right. Right. I mean, I've had some great people, owners, and I teach them how to put a stop on the horse. And it's kind of like the easiest thing to do, but with some people, it just doesn't click, you know? Right. And, you know, all of a sudden, they can't stop the horse. They're trotting around, they can't stop the horse, you know, because they taught the horse to run through their hands. Mm -hmm. you know, so yeah, without knowing. It wasn't, it wasn't like it was intentional. Pardon? It wasn't like it was intentional. It was totally without knowing. No, no, it's not intentional on their right. part. They think they're doing all the right things, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, right. you know, uh, people, have, it's easier for people to intellectually understand it, but to put it into uh, uh, communication, you know, application, mm -hmm. Yeah. But the horse is something different for some people. Yes, absolutely. Well, it's, it's that whole line, knowing and understanding are two completely different things. You know, I, I yeah, joke exactly. all the time. You know, I mean, you do clinics all the time, and, yeah. and, and, and I bet you go back to the same barn, you know what I mean, with some of the same people, and they go, 
hmm, what happened? Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah, there's pieces that they miss or or things that yeah, they, the even if we think they understood they, it, they didn't quite they, get it. They uh, uh, skipped ahead or they ignored or didn't mm -hmm. correct when they should have corrected or, mm -hmm. sure. uh, you know, you know, riding horses, I mean, I don't, it doesn't, that's what I mean, the hard work is in the front end because that's when you have to learn you know, the application of it, you know, and yeah. teaching that horse. Right. And and if I can't teach someone to do that, and I can, but if I go off someplace, you know, and, and, uh, and I say if I'm gone for two weeks, I come back and I go, gee, what happened to the right lead, uh, left lead departure, right. you know? Well, we've been having trouble on that, you know, and that horse knows it's lead departures. Right, right. That horse knows to take the lead from a, from a halt, even, you know. Yeah. But it's, you know, we, we get busy, and we're all guilty of it. We get busy, but let's hurry up and get her done. I mean, it has nothing even to do with horses. It could be anything that, we, that you know, uh, like I'm putting a sprinkler system in for, you know, a house. You know, I want to hurry up and get her done. You know, this is like no fun, you know. <laughs> right. But I, I had to remind myself, okay, we can get her done. We haven't done this a whole lot, so there's a whole thing to it. So let's make sure we do all the right things. Yes. Instead right. of trying to, you know, do shortcuts. So we're, we all have that, that in us. Right. And then with horses, it seems, you know, like one gal told me one time, uh, and a long-term... Uh, uh, well, here, here's a perfect example. Yeah, it's, if, if I come back and, and, and they can't pick it up, the lead is because they didn't do something or they, uh, the horse did something and they let the standard slide. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes total sense. They let the standard slide. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, they, so instead of departing from a step, you know, one step, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, because I like the horse to take a step because that puts energy into the body. But all of a sudden the horse is doing two or three steps. Mm-hmm. Okay. Sure. Then it's doing, you know, four or five steps. Right. And pretty soon he asks for, you know, a lead departure from a halt. And it goes trot, 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 trot. Yeah, yeah, right, halfway around the arena before you get a canter. Halfway around the arena, and, mm -hmm. and, and what happened? Well, with the, the standard, we, we allowed the standard to slide. Yeah. You know, we didn't say, wait a minute, what's wrong here? Mm -hmm. How's come we're, it's, how's mm -hmm. come it's taking two or three strides? We had this down to either coming out of the pocket or one step, you know? Right. And uh, the, uh, so, Instead of working on it and recognize it when it was starting to be one or two steps, it got to be a problem where it was halfway around the arena. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So that's why sometimes you need a coach is good. Like I, I just worked with a lady today, and she said I worked with a lot of dressage trainers, and and uh, it like for one, this horse has learned to evade the bit. You, you, contact and and all of a sudden uh, there's some baggage going with that but it's it's abating a little bit and the horse starts going sideways and stuff and uh, so I tell her hey just loosen your feet a little bit on it and just send the horse forward you know back off your feet a little bit and send the horse forward you know sometimes that would work and and then and then uh, she was still having a little bit of problem I said listen why don't you you know, do you know, loosen up on the outside rein and do a turn on the forehand, point the horse where you want it to go, and just send it forward enthusiastically. You know, what you're doing is correcting the horse, you know, and, and it has to work for the correction. It goes right off. And she says, well, all the trainers I had, every time that happened, I'd ask them, what do I do, what do I do? And, she, and they'd go... Uh, well, I, I, I'm, I'm an instructor, not a trainer. Uh, I go, 
what the heck? Yeah. <laughs> Even sure. the instructors should know what to do. I mean, mm -hmm. my goodness, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's happened to probably any, about just about everybody, in some parts in their you know life, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, the horse not wanting to move forward or make contact or something for whatever reason. You know, especially if you're in the if you in the business. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, you know, the same person, the same big trainer says you you'll never you're never you're never going to canter that horse, and you'll never get a lead change out of that horse. And and I set that horse up purposely for that horse without her knowing it because every time I tell her, okay, we're going to do some counter canter work, you know what I mean? And she'd get all frustrated. So I'd have her do serpentines down through the cones. Mm -hmm. I mean, actually through the court letters. Okay. Mm -hmm. And and so she got down, it was nice and smooth, and I, and she was on the, you know, going uh, uh, from left to right. She was on the right lead. And and all of a sudden I said, now, put, put, put your right, as I'm talking, put your right leg back. And the horse switched to the lead. <laughs> and she says, well, what was that, that I, what it was? I said, well, you did your lead change that you're never going to get. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And, and that made her happy, you know. Sure, I mean, of course. You know, it's, it, you, you got to be some sort of a trainer. I mean, I, I asked her, I said, does anybody ever get on your horse? And she says, no, because they always tell me I have to learn how to do it. And I said, well, how can you learn how to do it if your horse is resisting all the time and you're working on the same problem? Right. And, and literally, this is the truth. I'm going to tell you two stories. I used to go to a ranch on the West Bay and the Bay Area, and before I moved to the East Bay, I went to another ranch. And I go do a lesson at the same time, and I'd watch this trainer and this her student work on the same problem for a year. And I'm not fudging. And it's the same situation, you know. I mean, she mm -hmm. she was working with this trainer for one year. This client I have here, and and the husband says, you know, I want you to think about it. That she's been with you one year. And, and and you just told me you're not learning anything. And she goes, well, I really like her, but I do, you know, do want to learn something. We just work on the same stuff, you know, you know, uh, you know like the horse didn't even know how to go forward. And, and so my point was, does the trainer get on once in a while, help you out a little bit? Yeah, mm -hmm. you need to learn to do it and you will. But if you get in some rough spots and the horse gets a little backwards, you need someone's qualified to get on there and help the horse out so you can continue to learn. If, if that horse shuts down and starts backing up and starts getting light-footed, you don't know what to do about you know, uh, solving that potential rear-up problem. Sure, right, right. You know what I mean? So. It, it's better for someone to get on there one on that horse once in a while and and keep it tuned up. You know, that's that's kind of what I'm saying. If that all makes sense, I think it makes perfect sense, and it's something it reminds me. Um, I I spent a few months living with Ray Hunt, and he used to say to us all the time, you know, you're doing something you never did to get something you never had. Exactly. And I, I find that that's such a truth with a lot of uh, the riders out there. They're sure, trying sure. to teach their horse to do something, but they don't even know what the feel of that is. Right. You know? Exactly. Because I think there's a lack of riding made horses or riding school horses in the industry, at least in the States, from what I've seen. There's a lack of riding the horses that have the education so that they can give the education to the riders, and then those right. riders can carry that forward to their own personal horses. Right, at least they get to feel what it's supposed to feel like. Sure, sure. If you don't know yeah. what it feels like for a horse to be in the right balance for, say, tempi changes or a canter pirouette, if you don't know what yeah. it feels like for him to be in that balance, how do you know if he's even prepared or not? Yeah, well, it's kind of like the, the horse that we talked about going up the hill, pushing itself from the rear. Yeah, that's exactly it, yes. 
you know, never felt it, you know, horse pushing from the back, you know. Right. And feeling the back working, you know. I mean, I do this client that I'm working with. I only have a couple of clients because I don't want to get that busy. Uh, I work with her a couple. Of, I work with her two days a week and I ride a horse once a week. And she she had a movement the other day. She did something with the horse and I said, now, Mechanically, you're doing pretty good. You're you're getting your timing is getting good. Your rein position, you know, where you're holding your hands, because she used to take her hands and kind of curl it under, you know. Mm, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sure you've seen that. Yep. I mean, it happens a lot. Yes, know? that that sort of and, puppy dog uh, begging at the table you're risk. Good with your hands. <laughs> you're not so busy with your legs. You know what I mean? And you're getting a little quiet. You're starting to get your balance. I said, but now you got to start feeling. Mm. Because now, because the reason I brought it up, the, uh, the horse got behind the leg and automatically she corrected the horse. She didn't ask me what was going on. She automatically took the horse with a uh, dressage stick. The horse went forward and she went on. We're... Before she 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 go well. What's going on? What's going on? You know. Now she's starting to learn to feel what how that horse is getting behind the leg, and her timing is getting better. And then every time we get a good movement, I says, "Did you feel that?" And she says, "Yeah." I says, "Use that as a, a Kodak moment. You know, when you get a mm-hmm. picture or you see something you like. Well, yep. this is a picture of the feel." Yes. So the next time you're looking for that, you know what to look for because you felt it before. And if you don't feel it, then you know you don't have it. Right. You know? It's, it's kind of like a lot of people, kind of like, um, are we going on too long here or what? <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, I'm good if you're good. <laughs> no, no, I just, you know... Uh, but this is all good stuff, I think. You know. And, I think so too. Uh, if you if you have a feel for something, and oh, I was going to say, sometimes people work too much in the gray area. Yeah. Well, I I think you did. Well, I think I felt it, and I tell him if you think it did and think you felt it, you didn't feel it. Right. I mean, he didn't do it. You know, like if if you do a haunches in, you feel a movement. Is that correct? You know, I mean, it's, it's a it's a distinct movement. Right. There's no so gray area in there. And I'm watching, and the and she, and the hip comes in. You know, I mean, eh, a slight try. You know, it might be good if you're teaching the horse for the first time. You know, you might you know say, okay, I'll take that. You know what I mean? And you're going to start asking for a little bit more. And and so she can't feel that, and she'd go, well, I, I think I felt it. I go, no, you didn't, because you're not going to get the feel until he's double tracking, okay, until the front feet are tracking straight and the rear, okay? And that's a real significant movement. It feels almost awkward, mm-hmm. you know? And so if you don't feel that, then you didn't get it, you know? And so, and to go, well, I'll never get it. Well, you're, you're never going to get it if you keep saying you're never going to get it. Right. You you have to start visualizing what you're doing. One of the things that I learned a long time ago in my early years, uh, uh, I think kind of the reason why I was able to be sexful, successful uh, early in life is I've learned, I was able to perceive myself doing what I needed to do or learn. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I projected an image, and I this is what I want. I see myself doing it. And sometimes it's hard, but but you have to practice at it. And if, you, if what I found, if you can't see yourself doing it or imagine yourself doing it, you're physically not going to be able to do it. Right, right. Whatever you know, it was... It, it, What's it's that old line? Game. Train horses is a, is, a, is a metal game. Exactly. Yeah. What's that old line? Whatever, if you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. 
Absolutely. Yeah. So that brings me into a question here, Charles, um, that that I'm always fascinated with as a professional in the industry, as somebody who uh, presents at expos and teaches clinics all the time. I'm always curious to hear uh, the thoughts of others on this. And you've the way that you've presented this, I think, is is a fantastic segue for that. Have you gone to say present at an expo and they bring you a horse, whatever the horse is, for whatever the demo happens to be? and you pick up on that lead rope or you reach down on that rein or you touch with your leg and you realize that what that horse needs is completely off topic from what that demo was yeah. supposed to be do you have do you have any kind of stories that you can think of from those moments well yeah real easy because uh, uh, I explain to people there's certain exercise that I do with the horse on the ground before I go even get on the horse mm. Uh, I do what I call a concentrated circle. It's kind of almost like, sort of like a shoulder in. I, I'm looking for the hips to cross. Kind of think of in terms of a wagon wheel. Okay. Like the, and, and you're the hub. And, and the horse has to travel, the left front has to travel on the rim. And the left rear has to cross over the right. So it's a little oblique, you know, so mm -hmm. it's not a perfect circle, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. A perfect bend to that circle. And what's going to happen is that I'm, I'm teaching the horse to go forward. I'm teaching that horse to yield to my hands, regardless of the halter or, or snap a bit. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and I teach the horse to go forward 
It has to accept contact. And, it, and what it does is going to put pressure on the horse, and you're going to see where his attitude is at. Okay. And, and from there, you know, if, if he shows a little attitude because I tapped him to go forward on the, on the hip and he kicks out, well, I'm going to correct it. I'm going to correct it below the hock. And, I, and then I tell the audience, this is, this is a horse that you want me to get on. Now, we're going to get on, but I, I want to see what this horse is made of. You know? Mm-hmm. If, for me to do a lead change takes me sort of a different exercise to do that, that lead change. Well, to me, it starts on the ground. Mm-hmm. If I got a horse that doesn't have a good attitude and a horse that doesn't take pressure, what am I going to get out of him? Right. If I'm in the saddle, it's a lot safer on the ground, right? And and less safe in the saddle. Now, doesn't mean that you know you're going to make him perfect, but at least there's certain basic exercises I do on the ground. Like the other thing I do. Once I do that, or I may have to lunge them. I come in, the head's up in the air, you know, and they want you to get on and do lead change. Yeah. You know, uh, and so uh, first I, ha- I tell them, I said, if, if you've got a student come in the classroom, right, and, and he's been on sugar all morning because mom's been letting me drink Pepsi or eat <laughs> cupcakes for breakfast. Right. You could have the best teacher in the world, but that student is not going to learn nothing. Right. He, he, he can't. He can't. And he can have a high IQ. He right. He can be right. a very trainable learning person, you know. But because of that adrenaline, you know, that sugar high, he, he's, he, he's not going to hear the alarm go off because there's a fire. Right. Okay, because he's just so intense about himself. And... And he's just all over. He's, he's not focused. All right, so I tell the audience, I said, if I can't get my student to pay attention to me, you know, if I can't get him to keep an eye on me or get at least one ear flicking on me, you know, I realize I only got, you know, 45 minutes to an hour. But if I can't get my student to pay attention to me, then how, how can I ask for a lead change? You know right. what I mean? How can I teach my horse to stop? Because... He's, he's focused, he's you know, all over the place. He's got his head up in the cloud. So I had to have my student paying attention. Yeah. You know, and, and it's really that simple, and people get that, you know. Um, and, and there's some other exercise I do. I move the hip over, and I teach him to back up, you know, and I put that in, and I do it on both sides. Mm-hmm. And when I see he's not going to buck, and he's comfortable with the saddle, oh. and, and he... He's getting some business ears on him, you know. He's, you know, he's paying attention to me. I'll get on anything. I'll get on an unbroke horse. I've been on an unbroke horse, and I'm sure you have. It took me. I did a thing up in uh, where was it? Uh, up in Washington. In fact, the, the guy that put it on is the guy that does the two events in Canada, and he he wanted to do one in California. We and I did that challenge. I had a I had a horse that took me took me three sessions to get that horse uh, to a point he was comfortable with the saddle and his head was on straight. Mm. But what I liked about the horse, which is better than the other two, and I bought one of the other ones. <laughs> uh, the other two were just like a, a, a black lab. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah. kind of easy going, whatever you want. Uh-huh. But they had no had no go. Mm. But that little Palomino had a lot to go, and that's what I wanted. I so so towards the end of the last session, I was able to get on the horse. All right, it took me that long to those beginning sessions to get that horse quiet. And and all I did. The, all I did, and, and I didn't have any go problem, because as soon as I got on, that horse started to move right out, which I was counting on. Mm-hmm. And all I worked on was moving hips and shoulder control. And then 
then we had the next, I think it's, I think you get a half a session, I think, I can't remember how their program is, and then we had to go out. Well, I ended up winning, because I had a horse that would go forward. Right. And I didn't even, I didn't even loop the horse, because I told him I wouldn't loop the horse, because the, the footing was terrible. Uh-huh. You know, they, they tried to mix clay, I mean, they learned since then, you know. Mm-hmm. They're great people, really great people. Uh, and there was just, they mixed it with clay and something else, and there's all these big pot hole, potholes, you know. Oh, yeah, I yeah. says, I'll trot the horse, but I won't canter the horse. You know, and, and I end up, you know, I end up winning, you know. I mean, that's one of those things that, thank you, Lord, <laughs> for getting me through this one, you know. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, uh, I don't know how you do yours when you're out there, if there's any kind of warm-up on the ground or anything. But I always explain to people, I, I do a pre-check. I, sure. I don't care. I don't care if it's uh, uh, Tom McKetchen, you know, with his fabulous reigning horse, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I came here to Aiken one time, and um, they... they, they uh, and, Christmas and they wanted to go on a trail ride. I said, yeah, but I need a horse. And I said, well, I got a polo trainer that'll on your horse. I said, well, make sure he knows I like to do a little bit of groundwork, you know? And and she knows that. She was a editor for a horse and rider. Mm. And uh, we were really good friends. So the, the uh, polo trainer, he was, about, I think, about a year older than I was. I think I was 71 at the time. And uh, he, you know, he's, I'm doing a little groundwork. I wasn't lunging. I was just moving the horse around me. I wanted to feel what he was doing, you know. He was kind of sticky, you know. And and he started talking. and says, yeah, she said something. You want to do some groundwork. But, I, you know, I think it's really not necessary. You know, and I don't feel really good about it. I wish she'd just stop, you know. And I, I said, okay, you know. Uh, let me go ahead and do that. Let me just kind of move the hips over a little bit and, and I'll stop, you know. And I did that, you know, respecting him. It's his mm-hmm. horse, you know. Sure. And and I got on and uh, as soon as I got on, the horse wanted to, you know, step forward, you know. So I picked up the reins and backed up the horse. And the horse, I really believe this was a reining horse at one time because it had all the cues, you know, if you knew where to look for them. And backed up, and he was kind of stiff jawed, you know. So, you know, I, I picked up one rein a little bit more than the other, and I, I and offset it, so he's kind of like moving one shoulder at a time, type of thing. And he loosened right up, and I released, you know. And then I went to pick up some more. And he says, "Well, I really appreciate if you wouldn't do that, you know. He's he's fine." And I said, "Well, he's really stiff, you know." He said, well, I just appreciate he wouldn't do it. I said, okay, you know, so I, I checked to see what kind of hind end control I had, you know. And anyway, he goes on and on about that, okay. Hmm. So he's telling me how wonderful this horse is. So I'm on the horse, and he goes, oh, can you help me hold my horse? I have to, I have to use a money block, and he won't stand at the money block. <laughs> and I said, are you kidding me? You're telling me that what I'm doing is wrong and your horse... Won't he stand at the mining block? <laughs> and I said it kind of sarcastic. You know, right, but, right. Uh, but, you know, I just, are you kidding me? You know. <laughs> so anyway, we there's three, there's four of us now. And so we all go out, head out. My horse is the last one. And all of a sudden, you know, his buddy's sorry. He wants to trot up. Well, I don't force a horse to stay behind. Mm-hmm. Uh, my philosophy is if I hold the horse behind, it just puts more fuel uh, into you know, the fire, you know. Sure, so it, sure, it just adds more motion to the problem. Because the horses get further out and they want to get up there. Yep. So I did like a few half off, you know, and that way he can keep going and, you know, I can kind of rebalance him. And he goes on about, you know, you're fiddling with the horse. And finally, I just stopped the horse. I got off the horse and I said, listen, I appreciate you bringing the horse. You were told I like to do groundwork and you got up concerned about some of it. And I stopped because I respected you because you're the owner of the horse and you have to pay the bills on it. Mm -hmm. And I quit. I says, but if you're going to babysit me while I'm out here, I'm not interested. Yeah. 
doesn't mean I'm better than you or you're better than me. It's just I'm not interested in babysitting. I can babysit myself. And I got off, and he goes, where are you going? I says, I'm, I'm taking the horse um, back to the trailer and tying him up and pulling my tack off. Because my daughter-in-law was out here, and I had her saddle. Mm. He said, well, you can't do that. He won't stand at, he won't stand at the trailer. I go, not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> Get him broke. Oh, you know? my. <laughs> so we all came back, you know. <laughs> and, and my friend said, what's going on? You know, because they were kind of ahead chit-chatting. Mm. And I said, I just, the same story I told you and your audience, you know, I, I try to respect and do all the right things, but I, I'm not interested in babysitting. And, of course, my wife says, can't you just get along to get along? <laughs> well, I can if you meet me halfway. You know? Right. But you, right from the getting, you know, because their thing is, well, we don't train when we go out on the trail. Oh, and I boy. said, well, yeah, so you let them pull on your hands and you let them trot off when you don't let them trot off. That's training. Right. So, <laughs> it's all good. Man. It is. Well, that's it. It's all It's all good. It's all good. You know, so you learn things from that, you know? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't care. I, I had a, a clinician in Hawaii. Uh, he had his horses there he's demonstrating. He had two horses trying to rearrange in his big trailer, you know. Uh, I think it was a four horse or something. And, and I know him. He's a nice guy, really nice guy. And, and he's a good horseman. And he asked me two horses, and are they pushy? Mm. Well, I correct them, you know. You give me a horse, and he's not standing still. I'm not going to let him walk all over me or bump into me. Mm-hmm. But I expect the same thing. If I give you a horse and he's not up to sure. your standards, right? And he's out of line, I expect you to take care of it. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. Right. Well, and that's all about the relationship in there. Well, it's it's a relationship with a horse. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I, I I trust I trust if I'm going to give someone a horse. I, I, I'm going to trust them to do the right thing. Right. That's what I trust. That's the relationship. Right. Well, we're going to be able, guy. We've been going on here a couple hours. We have. We have. Um, let's see. We do have two great questions from our audience, okay. if you'd like to field those. Uh, here sure. we've got, let's see, Peggy sends in the question, uh, I have a nervous, anxious horse. He was started by another trainer and pushed too fast with harsh methods. Uh, is there any advice, uh, it's her actually, it's a mare, is there any advice on getting her calm, brave, and relaxed? Well, that, that's a, you know, very honest question, but uh, Peggy, you're, you're not alone. There's a lot of horses out like that. And, and the good news, it doesn't make any difference to circumstances, and that's what I found out about horses. Uh, it doesn't matter. Horses are wonderful to work with. If you give another option that's better for them, they're going to want to take that option just because it's easier. You know, the horse is nervous and anxiety for whatever reason. I, I, I have seven personalities. I came up and I wrote it in my book. Uh, I did. I wrote that book about 12 years ago, and there's seven basic personality, and one of them I call Nervous Nelly, and and that's these kind of horses. And what you have to work with, and 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 if you're not, you know, able to, you know, uh, or find someone you can work with, is they have to learn. It, this this is emotion. All this stuff, this anxiety and stuff, is all part of their flight mechanism. Mm -hmm. Okay, and 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 it's come up in a different form of anxiety, but it's it stems from the flight, and and you have to be able to work through that, you know. And what we've been talking about earlier, sometimes when I get a horse like that, uh, that's not paying attention to me, it's kind of all over the place and a little jumpy. Uh, number one, here, something you can look at, I don't know what kind of feed you're feeding it, but the first thing I would look at is the feed. Are you feeding it any uh, cob type? That's a, cob is like corn and rye and oat. It's, it's, a hot, it's a hot grain. 
Uh, if you are, take it off of it. Uh, there's plenty of grain out there that doesn't give it the hotness and get probably better nutrition. The other is what kind of hay are you feeding? You know, uh, I don't know where you're living, uh, but uh, it, in a lot of states, it's a lot easier to get alfalfa than anything else, you know, grass hay. I, I like uh, wheat hay uh, and then grass hay. But alfalfa hay has a lot of protein. It's a very hot hay. In other words, it produces a lot of energy, and it can produce that kind of energy level that you're talking about. Uh, in fact, Peggy, I brought horses into the barn and I changed their diet. And the neat thing about this when you try it is this, if, if you feed it alfalfa uh, in eight to 10 hours, 12 hours max, it gets through their system. And, and so instead of feeding them you know, alfalfa hay, uh, feed them some grass hay or wheat hay. And if you see a change in the behavior, and then part of that is that anxiety is is fuel, uh, is the food that you give it. You know, I've seen that a lot. i seen, when they come in, I do that, and pretty soon, like night and day, you mm -hmm. know. And uh, it, it shortens the, the time, training time down. Because just like uh, uh, the horse that's high anxiety, you can't teach it anything. It's like it's on sugar. Now, if it's not that, then do uh, what I call a line exercise. I usually start with a 12 or 14 inch line and I teach them to move around me and stop their feet. Now here's the key. Stop the feet and let them pause. That's the key. Mm -hmm. Change directions and then send them back. Now, if they don't want to stop, they don't know what the cue is to stop and, and don't have a cue, then you may have to get strong with the lead rope to get them to stop, but you have to get them to stop, period. Then pause. The pause is important because if you just, you just lunge them around and around uh, and just, or just stop and change direction and don't give them a way out, or don't give them a reason to change, their, their, the emotions that, that they're, uh, they have it, then they're just going to get hotter and hotter. But if you stop, pause. Now, they may still be anxious and they still may be full of energy, uh, but you have to give them that opportunity. Now, that opportunity doesn't have to be 20 minutes. It, it could be, you know, two or three minutes to see if they're going to pay attention or not. Because mm -hmm. you want their eyes looking on you. Mm -hmm. The other thing, next thing you want to do is, you know, do that until finally, when you stop them, they, you get both ears on them. And, and now here's another key. If they stop and give you both ears and both eyes and all of a sudden jerk the head away and look at something else, go back to the exercise. Now, you can't do this exercise at a walk. Walking does not utilize their body, their muscles. Trotting or canter work uses more, it calls more from them. Uh, and, and, and do that until finally they look at you and you can go up and pet on them and you don't have to worry about them. And it may take two or three sessions. Then once you got that going and you made, it made some progress, it may not be 100%, but they're at least paying attention, and you brought their their anxiety level down from 100, let's say, down to uh, 20, mm -hmm. and you still got 20 to work with, then you can start introducing things like uh, uh, flipping the lunge line that you got over their back, around their feet, make sure they're comfortable with that because every horse should. Uh, I like to use a, a long dressage stick. I call it a... Um, uh, you know, in hand stick and I tie a plastic bag on the end of it, small for the first time, nothing flapping big, and start sacking them out with that around the legs. Uh, if they start getting excited, if you try to stay with it, and if they keep moving faster, faster, put it back in the circle and go and, and to get the 
uh, sacking out part of it, which is what he's doing, and change direction until they settle back down again. But make sure you stop and give them the opportunity to settle down. This is the key. You can, with that, that exercise, you can teach the worst Arab to step on a tarp tar and stand there like nobody's business. Because what's happening is they find, they learn to accept the object because it's much easier because you gave them an opportunity to stop and pause and calm down, they're going to find that safe zone, okay? Mm -hmm. It just happens to be on the tarp. Right. You're allowing that to be the easy place. Just allowing that to be the easy place, you know? Mm -hmm. But, you know, it just takes time. You know, some horses, I can get it done on the first day. Sometimes it takes me a week when a horse comes in, sure. you know? Depends, uh, you know, how, how much flight's in this horse. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, but the first thing you want to look at is uh, your, your horse's diet. And if you're feeding it a hot fuel or feeding it off, off uh, I'm almost willing to, to bet that that's probably a lot of the, the big problem. Mm -hmm. I love you that. Oh, sorry. See, um, it's like people that have trauma in their life and they're early. There's things that's happened to me in my early life that, you know, I don't particularly fond of and bad experience. But what I learned, I can't live in the past. Right. I, the only thing I can do is go forward. And that applies to horses. You know, horses are more willing to go forward. They're, they're hanging out in the past, you know, and you can help them go forward. And that's what's neat about horses. You just, they just have to have a way. Uh, I, I've gotten some really hot horses and, and Patrick could tell you I'm sure he's had them do you know mm -hmm. what you can do with them with a few simple principles right, you know? right. the whole thing is you got to get them to relax and that's your job to get them to relax yes and here's a tool that will help you absolutely well and it's been proven that learning doesn't happen until relaxation comes into play yeah, and that's part of the training uh, uh, ladder of dressage. Exactly. Dressage is nothing but a trained horse. You, the horse has to be relaxed at a walk, trot, and canter. You know mm -hmm. that, and you can't you can't teach a horse anything until they're relaxed, and uh, you can't uh, you know uh, perfect your gait unless the horse learns to relax. You know. Right. Uh, it's all part of the program. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So thank you, Peggy. Yeah, that was that was great, and I love that you went to the idea of nutrition to begin with, and the feed to begin with, because that's a perfect segue also into the next question. So Shelby sends in the question that she's got uh, a challenge with gastric ulcers blocking her successful forward training, and now the question is, ulcers or actual roadblocks in training? How do you know? And when do you decide if it's the ulcers, if it's the physical challenge, or if it's the uh, if it's the actual training roadblock, if it's more of a mental challenge? Yeah. Well, it could be all the above. I just happened to go through this with one of my clients, and uh, we're still communicating. Uh, she rides her Saj, and uh, she just bought a Spanish horse, and and uh, I started on the saddle, and then we found a dressage trainer for uh, because I wasn't going to be around. I was going to be on the East Coast. I'm trying to get her to move out here because the Spanish horse is very cool. But uh, there's, there's number one, do, do, we knew, do we know do we know that it has ulcers? Okay? First we got to know that. Mm -hmm. If you don't know that and just think you know, then what we can do uh, what you can do is, and it's expensive, is to buy ulcer guard and give that to them for a month. Mm -hmm. If you see a change, then you know it's ulcers. Mm -hmm. If you have them scoped, it's going to cost you a lot more money <laughs> than the ulcer guard. Okay. Sure. But the other thing is too, it could be ment you know, mentally, you know, uh, block, you know, training block, you know. I mean. Uh, but I'm with you. I, I uh, there's a horse that I'm working with here. Is uh, I, it's a nice horse, uh, and uh, it, it foundered pretty bad. Not terrible, 
the least it, it's not bad at all. I mean, it, anything found there is bad. Uh, but there's no rotation, and uh, and they put it on a strip diet because the horse was too fat, which just causes a lot of founder. Um, and so what I had her do is she wanted me to start working with the horse, which I had. But what I did, I wanted her to get more film uh, on the horse, you know, his front feet, to compare mm-hmm. to what it was, mm-hmm. see if there's any changes. Because, you know, it, it's supposed to go back to work, and I work horses, you know, um, and, and there's a lot of pounding. Uh, the other thing is uh, it's a 15-year-old horse, and I wanted the, the hocks check mm-hmm. because the owner asked me why. I said, well, number one, age, you know, sure. is a factor. Uh, my horse Tennyson didn't have hock problems until, he, you know, it was, uh, almost mid-20s. But my, you know, little black quarter horse mare, uh, you know, she got him when she was, uh, you know, uh, 10 years old because mm-hmm. it kind of goes with the quarter horse line to get them early, you know, right. just the co- part of the confirmation, the breeding, right? So you always want to check medically first, and I'll tell you why. I uh, I had a horse one time. I did a clinic in Southern California, and one of the participants uh, was riding in it, and uh, of course I didn't know anything about it. It was lepizone. And uh, it just they just brought it from uh, a place that was at a ranch for teaching horse to go forward. It wouldn't go forward. And of course, this was some years back, and yeah, I was a little cocky, and you know that's what happens when you're young. You know, you get kind of full of yourself, and you think you're the world. And uh, I'm just being honest. You know, it's part of maturity. You sure. Know? Right. Right. Yeah out of learning and so this horse was in and and uh, I, and I can I can teach a forward cue pretty good and uh, I, I and the whole thing is make sure you follow through and so anyway I get this horse and uh, she, she asked me if I would work with a horse in the clinic and she was having difficult because it's the follow through I ask I insist and then I demand now I demand could be with my spur, or it could be with a stick. I like using the stick because I can get further behind it than my spur, but I didn't have a stick. So the, I have good news and bad news. The good news, I did not draw blood. Uh, and the other good news is the horse walked, trot, and cantered. And the bad news is that about six months later, uh, the lady, um, said that she was having good success but still having some problems in other areas and they took it to um, Davis and they did some ultrasound or something and they found that the horse had a a pinched nerve in his Mm -hmm. back that's the bad news yeah do you realize how how I felt I felt terrible sure and, and that's why it's important any time a horse would come into barn, um, if I had any, first thing I do is, I, I don't do anything right away, but are you still there? Uh oh, looks like we lost our call with Charles. Let me call him back. This techie stuff. This is why I don't work for NASA. Hello. Hello, you hung up on me, man. No. <laughs> Technology. <laughs> right? Technology. I was just telling our audience, this is why we don't work for NASA. Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, my phone, the house phone, the battery may be going dead, but I'll, I'll button this up real quick. Ah. So it really made me feel bad. So the first thing I do with problem horses is make sure, hopefully, that there's no 
anything medically going on with the horse. Sure. Uh, before I do any serious training, you know, I'll train to make sure they're safe around people until uh, I, I can get them checked out. But mm -hmm. uh, you always want to check out the medical because that was that was a that was a hard lesson. And she wasn't upset with me when she called. Mm -hmm. uh, she just, you know, wanted to let me know what's going on, you know, and I appreciated it because that was a viable lesson. For sure. sure. Well, the thing about those things or those challenges is that you don't know until you know. Yeah. So it's it definitely, I think it becomes important that we learn to recognize little signs. And, and sometimes there are no signs, just like what you're talking exactly. about, you know. Yeah. Uh, and so it is. Yeah, the horse wasn't even cranky, you know. Yeah, right, right. Very interesting. I think my phone is uh, doing funny things, so maybe we ought to. Uh oh, yeah. Well, let's let's wrap this up. Those were our two questions that came in from the audience there. So I've got right. our last Thank minute. You guys. I've got our last minute wrap up questions here. So, uh, and this has been a ton of fun. Thank you, Charles. Um, if yeah. there was one specific thing that you could recommend for riders to focus on as a primary means of improving their horsemanship, what would that be? Forwardness. Ah, nice. Okay. If you could ride with anyone. You can't do anything oh. without forwardness. Yeah. This and is forwardness true. doesn't mean run away. And if you got a horse with too much go, then you're teaching the horse a woe. Right, right, right. If you could ride with anyone, past or present, who would it be and why? Oh, God, I, I got a lot of neat people and friends. I've uh, ridden with a few of them. Uh, I have ridden with Craig Johnson. I think he's a neat guy. I think a lot of him. Um, he is a neat guy. He talked a lot. I, I've, I've had a couple people ride in his clinics in California. Mm -hmm. he's, He's just a neat guy. I like his horsemanship skills. Probably the one bridalist uh, ride I saw uh, in an exposition, um, big competition, they did bridalist reigning pattern. His, uh, his shoulders never dropped, his tail, uh, the tail was never swishing, and the change of his was clean because the shoulders didn't drop. Usually when you ride bridalist, what people don't get is um, when you ride bridleless and you're going to do a pattern, you always school with a bridle or a snaffle, uh, and you're always schooling to keep that horse balanced and the shoulders upright, not falling out or falling in, mm -hmm. uh, and balanced from front to rear, for sure. Right. And so when you ride bridleless, you kind of lose that connection uh, to do, you know, keep it upright. Uh, and he did. He did a, a superb job. Great job. Yeah, yeah. He's a great. But there's fellow a lot sure. of other neat people. You know, I mean, uh, I've ridden with a lot of people, a lot of good people. I know out there. Very I good. ride probably most people out there. Even you, Patrick. There we go. Even me. Good. Well, I look forward to the chance to do that someday. We're not all that yeah, far away can. now, you know. Yeah. When, well, <laughs> we're, yeah. When you get down here, well, just let me know. And, yeah. For sure. Okay, We're at least now on the same side of the country. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I guess I wore out my welcome on the West Coast. You know, I had to go to the East Coast. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah. So what is your present personal definition of horsemanship? Oh, my, defi uh, my definition of horsemanship is not just riding. It's uh, about care for your horse, it's nutrition. Um, like that one client of mine said once, it says, you know what's good about you? You care about the whole horse. Uh, because you have to, because nutrition affects the horse uh, mentally and physically. Shoeing, you have to know a little about shoeing. Uh, I'm always involved in that, I, I just never, I always, checking out a new shoer like I had come up with a new shoer here and I like the guy and I like working with him and he likes to work with me so horsemanship covers all of that mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. great uh, and and you know here's here's another thing of horsemanship uh, I was at equine uh, not equine affair uh, what's the uh, is it Pittsburgh um, where they have the uh, expo at uh, trying to think of the name of it. She had two shows. One was up in Maryland. Oh, yeah, yeah, in uh, Harrisburg. 
Harrisburg. Uh-huh. Yes. The uh, the Horse World and, Expo. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I had I was in the small arena, but I had probably eighty percent of the small arena filled. And uh, I had, and I was doing demonstrating groundwork, and the uh, <clears throat> and I just started, and I noticed right away that horse was slightly off. Mm. And I and I stopped. I, I to be honest with you, probably ninety uh, percent of the people there probably wouldn't have recognized it, but just the other ten ten percent of the people that would. Mm-hmm. And uh, and uh, and and I didn't stop because of them. I stopped because of the horse because yeah. you don't know what's going on. Right. I don't want to exacerbate it, you know. Yeah. Because I was going to do a lot of groundwork. And, mm-hmm. and that can be a tough judgment call to make in a in a. Uh, Oh yeah, uh, I just started. Like so I, yeah. I, and the good news, uh, I faked it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, they tried to find another horse at the last minute, but I, I just kind of explained everything. I, I think I lost ten percent of the crowd, maybe not, maybe five percent. Uh, so I got blessed on that one. <laughs> yes, that's great. For doing, for doing the right thing, you know. Yeah. Well, keeping and the horse first is so important. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That is horsemanship for sure. For sure. Okay, what book are you currently reading, or what was the last book you read? Totally random. Doesn't uh, even have to have anything to do with horses. Oh, uh, well, that's the only thing I read. <laughs> 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 uh, the last book I read uh, was a book from Al Dunning. I'm good friends with Al Dunning, and he just finished up that book, The Hackamore. Okay. Uh, yeah, and it's an excellent book, and if anybody's interested in going into a Hackamore, that'd be a good book. To, uh, uh, him and Johnny, uh, not Johnny, uh, Benny Catron mm-hmm. uh, uh, did that, and, and, and since then, not too long ago, he passed on. Right, but right. It's a, it's a great book, great book. Awesome, good, good. Okay. Now, how can folks find you? Our listeners out there, if they're if they're looking to find more information about you, or maybe come visit with you at some point, how can they find you? Well, the, you know, we can always go to the website at uh, charleswilliam.com. Uh, just don't go to our store page because our it's all upside down, and we've been shut down on our store page for about a week for Uh-oh. some reason. We can't get people to get things done. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, I'm on Facebook, personal message, uh, the best thing to do is, uh, just, uh, draw, uh, send me an email if, you, if you're in the area, because I watch the email all the time. I don't, uh, I don't use face, uh, Facebook message much, you know, um, but, uh, go to email, I'll, I'll catch it if you want to meet up. And I have, I've met several people since I've been out here. I probably had more. I could probably have a ton of work if I wanted it, but uh, I'm not interested. I got a couple of years that I got in training plus my own, so that's enough. Good, good, fantastic. Okay, so Charles, one thing I didn't warn you about. Um, at the end of all of these broadcasts, and at the end of most of the videos that I do, I do a lot of live videos for our Facebook audience, sure. uh, we end with what we call the question of the day, where basically okay. I just come up with a random question off the top of my head, and I ask the audience, and they get to answer in the comment section. So anytime right. I have a guest on with me, the guest gets to ask the question of the day. So what uh, would be our question of the day for our audience? Hmm. Good question. Well, the question of the day is what qualified clinician uh, or to be a presenter? What qualifies a clinician to be a clinician? Uh, what qualifies him? Wow, that's a good question. That's a good question. All right, Gabe. And the reason to say that is uh, there's, there's a lot of people out there that call themselves a clinician uh, and doing clinics. The other thing is, on, on the heel of that, is if you find someone, uh, you know, go watch them someplace, mm. you know, if they're in the area. And, you know, audit. You know, auditing is a great tool. You, you'll learn a ton in auditing. I mean, I hate to say that because I make more money than, than people participating. <laughs> no, but it's the truth, the though. The reality is, it, as an auditor, you get... Uh, I only take in uh, eight to ten horses. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I just I just can't see 
you can't get any more than that. Um, just because you can't get enough work done. I, I feel if someone's going to pay me some money, they want to get some work done on the horse. Right. And uh, that requires me to get on the horse too. Um, and and if you if you got any more than that, it's pretty hard to do that. Mm -hmm. But as an auditor, you get to see the progression of each one of those horses and what it took from the owner and the clinician right. to get that horse to where it's at. It's kind of like this, if you listen to the early part of it of this is when I watched Stephen Peters. You know, he was at my ranch. I wasn't auditing. I was just watching, see what was going on, checking him out. And uh, and that's where I learned about the you know he, he makes a correction and leaves it alone, gets out of it. Mm -hmm. you know? And and you can see how the horse responds. You know, by that method. You know, when you pick on him, pick on him. You, uh, you you're not really getting the forwardness you need. You need. Uh, and they have a tendency to shut down because you're nagging on them. Right. Uh, and, you, and they're not going to be expressive. So, you know, if, you, if your horse needs to go forward and not listen to your leg, make sure you send that horse forward. The more, the heavier you have to use your stick, the more pronounced forwardness you need in that horse. Mm -hmm. You know, if I have to have give that horse a pretty good swat, it, it better be squirting out mm -hmm. so that the next time I ask he'll listen to that leg because he knows what's coming I had a guy once told me a long time ago and I can't remember his name uh, down in Arizona uh, and, I, and I, uh, he, he told me once he says if you're going to use the spurs make them bleed and, and he never told me the reason why because I was so dumbfounded by it you know to be honest uh, but, but after a few years, I, I, I finally got what he said, what it meant. It meant you don't want to use your spurs, but if you have to use them, you have to make it count so you don't mm -hmm. have to use them. Mm -hmm. If you got spurs on and you use your spurs all the time, then you're sending the wrong message and, you, and you're... In, it's a lot kinder to use your spurs once, or your dressage stick once, and then to nag, 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 and just think they're tolerating that because they don't know what you want. Right. Because right. they never got they you never got the response that you needed. Right. So they never get the clarity. They never get the clarity. Mm -hmm. And and that's what's that's the difference between, you know, a professional that knows what he's doing. If you see him reach back and swap the horse with a stick, you go, oh my God, but all of a sudden he's riding, the horse wakes up, he's expressive, and mm -hmm. that's why I said earlier the, the forwardness is, is, is huge. Yeah. You know, and people think the horse is forward, and Patrick and I can look at it and say, no, that ain't a horse, it's not forward. You may think right. it is, right. but it's not. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's great. So then, the question of the day is, what, um, what, what qualifies someone to be a clinician? Is that, is that yes. The, so great. if they're having to ties and themselves as a clinician, what qualifies them? I think it's a great what question. Are their credentials. I think it's a great question. That's something that, uh, yeah. You know, I, I, I've worked with some people. You know, and it's part of my credentials. You know, um, but you know, but. The, the success is, you know, the horse always has the bottom line. If you ever watch a horse being worked from someone, you know, I used to watch a guy that used to be in my business doing the expos, and the crowd loved him. They was paying attention to what he was saying and not paying attention to what was going on with the horse. Mm -hmm. The horse had a different opinion yeah. of what's being done. So the horse always has the bottom line. You know, if, if the horse is going forward he, and he's, his eye is soft, then the, then, then the guy is doing the right thing. Yeah. If, if, if the horse is still plugged up and there's confusion in the horse and he's tight in the face and 
he's not smooth or balanced or somewhat relaxed, mm-hmm. doing the wrong thing. Right. Right. The horse, horse has the bottom line. That's it. The horse is the truth. That's something that Ray used to say to us all the time, Ray Hunt. He would tell us that, you know, the people, the human has a lot of opinions, but the horse is a fact. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we can have, you and I can have a ton of opinions, and we can agree on a lot of them, mm-hmm. but, you know, the, what it's all about is what our opinions, how the horse is interested in our opinions. Right, exactly. And he's going to express you know, he's going to demonstrate one way or the other, you know. Right. Positive right. or negative. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that doesn't mean the horse butts you off. It just, just means, uh, you know, look at the eye. Look at the expression of the horse. Is the horse looking fluid when the guy's working with it, you know? He's got the bottom line. Right. We can be at you all day long, you know, it might sound good, but... That's it. The horse has the bottom line. I never met Ray, and I've never met any of the Dorrance brothers. Mm. I, I have to admit, I, uh, I went to a Dorrance uh, clinic, and I uh, can't even remember which one I was. And to me, it, to be honest with you, it looked like uh, confusion going on. I mean, there are about 30 people out there. They're all kind of doing something different, you know? Yeah. <laughs> It made me dizzy. I, I, I left <laughs> after about 10 minutes. And <laughs> maybe I'll try him out when he's, you know, see when he's got a few you know, less people, you know. <laughs> huh. but, uh, well, Charles, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much. Well, I hope I didn't drag your audience out too far out. No, I don't think so. It looks like folks have been sticking with us really well. This is great. This is definitely, I would say, this is one of our longer broadcasts, but it's been so much fun. The stories have been fantastic. Your insight has been priceless. This is great. Uh, thank you. I appreciate it. This and is great. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Listen, I, I, there's a lot of good guys out there. You know Richard Winters. He's, I've known Richard yes. since forever, and his kids when they're Tadpoles, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Richard's a great yeah, guy, the whole family. I used family. to call him. I used to call him. Uh, you know, I, I, I looked to solve problems, and one time I had a horse that I was having a problem with. And Richard, I feel comfortable enough that, you know, I can call up and say, Richard, I got this problem going on, and I did this and this. You got any suggestions, you know? You need to throw out some stuff. Yeah, I did that. Yeah, I did that. You know, and, and that's the way it should be, you yes. know? Yes. Because uh, none of us have the answers Absolutely. Know, uh, to the situation. I, uh, in a way, I kind of devoted my life. I changed a whole career, and my my wife says, you're going to do what? <laughs> she was happy with the hot tub and the Cadillac and the pool, you know. So, <la> so that kind of changed, you know. Right. you on a ranch, it gets dusty, you know. <laughs> Trading in the Cadillac for the pickup truck and the pool and the hot yeah. tub for the pitchfork and overalls, right? <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> oh, goodness. Okay, buddy, you take care, and uh, right. thanks for the invite. This Thank you so today. much. It was fun. Thank you. This has been so much fun. I look forward to the chance of actually meeting up together and uh, maybe getting a chance to ride together, too. Yeah, that would be perfect. That will be you. great. That will be great. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Take care. You Be bet. safe on your journey. Oh, thank you. You as well. All right, gang. I want to thank you so much for tuning in to episode number 27 of Talking About Horses. I really appreciate you giving Charles and I your ear through this long conversation. It was great. Please remember, if you've missed any of this, you can access the full broadcast through Facebook, YouTube, or iTunes by streaming direct, or by streaming directly from our website by accessing the Talking About Horses page from the Education drop-down menu. Through whatever platform you're listening, please be sure to give us a rating, a comment, a review, and a share with your friends. Your word of mouth and support is the fuel for this fire. Thanks again, guys. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Talking About Horses with Patrick King. If you enjoyed today's show, please leave a review and subscribe. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit pkhorsemanship.com. We'll catch you next time.